Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to SBI Health and Safety's webinar. My name is Amélie uh, Leduc. I'm a marketing advisor here at SBI. Um, thanks to all of you for being here on this Wednesday afternoon uh, and taking the time in your schedule that I assume is very busy. Um, I'm happy to discuss today uh, about electrical safety. Uh, as you know, uh, with electricity, there are never small dangers. Actually, as soon as there's tension, there's danger. So yes, uh, the, better, the best way to protect yourself uh, against the risk of electric injuries is to work with the electricity off. But unfortunately, it's not always possible. So this is why SPI um, intervention prevention and uh, VF Imageware has decided to join together and create this webinar in order to uh, educate you and help you promote a more preventive approach. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleased uh, to have uh, with us today two experts in the field. First of all, Pascal Poisson. Uh, bonjour, Pascal. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, you? Good. Uh, Pascal is an electrical um, and safety engineer. Actually, Pascal is a partner with SPI with his uh, own company, Intervention Prevention. Uh, he has been in the business for almost 20 years, and he, uh, as I just mentioned, he's built his own company, but he also participated in various projects um, as an engineer, a researcher, a trainer, and a consultant um, in the field of industrial security. Uh, in terms of electric, electrical safety, uh, Pascal has implemented different programs, conducted uh, several incident energy studies, and actually trained nearly 10,000 workers. So um, he knows what he's talking about. And also he's a lecturer here at a school, uh, Polytechnique de Montréal, which allows him to be constantly on the lookout for the latest news from the industry. So uh, we definitely have an expert with us at the table. Uh, with us too, uh, Tara Siegel from VF Imageware. Hi Tara, how are you? Hi, hi everyone, I'm good, thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, with us today as well. Um, Tara has been with VF Imageware for about nine years. She is the territory um, sales manager for Quebec and Ottawa, and she specializes in commercial development and product development. So her knowledge of the product will help uh, will help to the uh, to elaborate solutions to different electrical risk uh, concern or problems or. Uh, questions you may have. So uh, together, these two experts will help you to better understand the importance of protecting yourself uh, before the tension rises. So definitely you're in good hands. Uh, before we start, just a few technical elements. Um, the webinar will last for about 45 to 60 minutes. We'll reserve the last 10 to 5 to 10 minutes to answer your questions uh, or any comments you have. Uh, however, you don't have to wait until the end to ask your questions. You can do so uh, as we go along with the presentation. There's a Q&A box on your screen just at the bottom right. Uh, th that So you feel free to send us your questions. If we don't answer them immediately, we will do so by the end of the webinar. And if time uh, goes fast uh, and we don't have time to, um, be sure that we will uh, respond to your question on an individual basis uh, within the next uh, few days. Um, yeah, so your answers will be uh, will be responded. Um, also, if you need any support uh, after the webinar or you have um, any needs or anything, my email address is on the screen in front of you. Uh, even if your questions are uh, for Pascal or Tara, you may send them to me and I will transfer all of the information to the person, uh, the concerned person. Um, Another thing that I'd like to talk to you about today before we start is that, um, as you know, SPI um, is the main preoccupation, the main um, priority here at SPI is accident prevention. And this is why we decided to create a brochure that is dedicated entirely to electrical safety. Uh, and we're proud to share it with you today uh, as it's never been launched before. So you will be the first one to have the link and to be able to download it and it's called Electrical Safety in the Workplace. Uh, in this brochure, you will see different information on the norms, on the control of electrical risk, uh, the standard regulation, and obviously the products that are available uh, in regards to uh, electrical uh, safety. Um, and you will receive that link uh, uh, by the end of the webinar, as well as um, the replay link, because this webinar is actually being recorded and will be um, available for replay uh, right after. 
So before we get started with the, the main topic, we like to know who we are talking to uh, in order to um, to concentrate our comments or our real life uh, uh, real life stories maybe more appropriately to the industry that that are pertinent to you. So first of all, we'd like to know which sector of activity do you work? Is it the mining industry, the construction industry, the manufacturing industry? the oil and gas industry, or any other industry. So please take a few seconds to answer A, B, C, D, or E. And we will be able to see the result in a few seconds. All right. Okay. So... Um, 33% of you are from the construction industry, 17% from the mining industry, same as manufacturing. We have nobody from oil and gas, and 33% are from another industry. Interesting. Um, another interactive question in order to know who we are talking to is we want to know at what stage do you find yourself right now in the implementation of your electrical safety program? Uh, is it A, you don't have a program, but it's in the plan to build one. B, you're, um, in order to complete your program, you need to have a hazard risk analysis. Is it C, that you need to be trained uh, and or updated on the training requirements for your program? or D, that you need to be audited on the performance level of your program, or is it E, you're in full control of your prevention program? So please take a few seconds again to answer and uh, let us know what stage um, of the implementation uh, phase you're at, you're in. All right, okay, so 40% of the people uh, don't have a program, but are planning to build one. 20% need to be trained or at least updated on the training requirements for their program. And 40% uh, are in full control of their preventive program. What do you think of these results, uh, Tara so, and Pascal? Uh, actually, very interesting. We're kind of split on both ends of the spectrum. It's, you know, either I'm completely lost and help me or, uh, I'm in full control and understand everything there is to know about electrical safety. So, um, you know, hopefully for those who aren't sure or for the 20% who said that they need training, I think we'll answer a lot of questions today. But I'm also happy to see that already 40% of you uh, have a good understanding of what's required. And maybe you're just here to brush up on some pointers. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, everybody, for uh, answering the questions. And, uh, well, without further delay, let's get deep into the topic with Pascal, who will start with the accident st statistics. Thank you, Emily. So uh, we'll start with the accident types. So the first one is about the contact with the overhead power lines. So a lot of accidents is uh, on that. Uh, for 39 person so it's a lot of construction worker who touch the uh, overhead power lines with this uh, um, on on the roof uh, contractor or something like that to touch it uh, the other uh, 30 percent is about the faulty equipment and correct connection so since 10 years now in canada we talk a lot about the arc flash now uh, but the shock hazard uh, continue to exist so uh, it's really important to uh, talk about the extension power cars, the electrical end tools, uh, other type of equipment. In the food industries with a lot of water, this can be an issue to have uh, incorrect or, or damage um, extension cars. Uh, the other part is the live work on construction site for 50% of all uh, the accidents. So normally it's more at the end of the construction during the, um, the commissioning. So when they try to start the new machine or uh, if they try to put uh, the power on the uh, the lightning, something like that, the lights, it can be an issue. And the uh, first topic we'll talk Today is about the live work in the establishment, so directly in your plans for 25%. So this is the big uh, subject of, of the two-day uh, webinar. 
So the main causes of the electrical accidents, the first one is the poor inspection and maintenance. It's why the standards since 2015, they talk a lot about maintenance. So it's why it's really important to maintain our um, electrical equipment. It's like you uh, do at home. I'm sure in your home, every month you check your GFCI devices, you test and reset all your, uh, your plugs, uh, your receptacles inside your bathroom, something like that. And every year you uh, just test your breakers to put on and off just be sure the, the little grease inside your breaker is is um, it's not uh, ticked to, together and every three years you call a, a contractor electrician just to inspect all your electrical installation so i'm sure everybody of you uh, do it so it's why um, i'm not really sure about that but it's why we have to talk about maintenance so it's really important to maintain just be sure you have no problem with the electrical installation and be sure it's in good condition to avoid the risk of accidents. The other point is about environmental issues, so about dust, like in the mines industry or um, wood industry, just be sure they don't go inside the electrical equipment and have some corrosion, so it can be some soap too in the um, uh, food industry too, so you have some contaminant around who can have a big problem with the electrical equipment. And the last one will be the human organizational factor. So unsafe work practices, non-compliance with safety rules during design or modification. As this is the more difficult to control on that point. So it's why you have to audit your people. You have to inspect the um, equipment like Tara will um, talk to you a little bit later in this training. So this is the uh, all the point uh, you need to work on to reduce your risk of accidents. So that the, we have different regulations and standards in uh, in Canada. The first one is the CSC Z462 is a standard. It's based on the NFP 70. So we talk about base because we copy the um, American standard. If you check the uh, American standard, you have the next uh, revision date. So maybe it will be in 2021 around that. And uh, four months after that, you have the CSC weather revision. And six months later, it will be the French version of the CSA. So this is a progression of the standard in Canada. Uh, the other, the CSA Z463 appear in 2014 is the guideline on maintenance of the electrical systems. So they try to improve the maintenance of the electrical equipment. So it's why they build this guideline. The guideline is more on when you're supposed to do your maintenance and not really on how you're supposed to do it. If you want to have more information on how to do it, you have the standard NFPA 70B and the NITA MTS. We have a lot more information on that point. The ULC S801 is a, a partnership between Hydro One in Ontario, Hydro Quebec in Quebec, and uh, British Columbia Hydro uh, to build the um, a safety standard on the transmission and distribution lines. So it's you have to work, uh, for example, if you uh, are in the paper mills and you have your own distribution uh, lines, you can use the standard to know. Uh, which step you're supposed to um, to use to protect your uh, workers. And the, the other standard is the IEEE 1584 about the guide for performing arc flash hazard calculation. So this is the standard we use to do the labeling inside this, uh, the plants, just to know which type of PPE you're supposed to use and all level of protection. And the CSC Z460 is the lockout tagout standard. So the control of hazardous energy so this is the base of all these other standards. Normally, an uh, electrician or a technician is supposed to lock out, uh, to lock his machine before they uh, do something. But we will discuss about it a little bit later. But for troubleshooting and and testing, is not uh, always necessary because it's hard to do this type of task. It's why you're supposed to do a risk assessment and be sure your worker is properly uh, uh, protect. Uh, so this is what in the Canadian Electrical Code, uh, the, what is an obligation is to mark on your electrical equipment, they have an arc flash and shock hazard. So in 2007, the Canadian Electrical Code, they put the arc flash now. So you have two main hazards uh, to work inside this type of equipment. But 
if you um, go uh, on the incident energy approach, you have this type of, um, of label. So this is an example. Now, since 2015, we try to be uh, more simple on the, uh, on the labeling. So this is uh, an example of that. So arc flash and shock hazard to respect the regulation. And after that, you have the safety boundary. Uh, we are not mark all the boundary, just mark one of them uh, now, just to be more simple for everyone. After that, you have the category of, um, of uh, clothing. I know in 2018, they want to separate the category per square centimeter with the category, but it uh, I like to uh, mark it together because uh, sometimes it's a little bit more information. So it's why I mark category two and in parenthesis, uh, eight carry per square centimeter at 45 centimeter. So it's just to so be more clear how I do the study and what is the spec of the calculation. And the last point is about the insulated gloves at one kV and little gloves over it because in Canada normally we are at 600 volts. It's why it's the main gloves we use is the one kV, but um, the five volts it can be another issue for the 460 and 480 uh, plant. We use the, this type of voltage. So, uh, like I said, the, the new, in 2018, the new uh, part of the standard is to work on the risk assessment. It's like I do on the machine safety because I do a lot of machine safety too, and it's always a risk assessment before uh, a task or before modifying a machine. So, this is the same thing as the um, Canadian and American standard on the electrical safety in the workplace. So, always prioritize electrically safe work conditions and the energized work. So, it's not always simple because they have to be planned but it will be more safer and it will be better for and the work will go will be do, do faster too. so the first risk we'll talk together is about the electrical shock so the electrical shock uh, you have the electrification and the electrocution. So the big difference between both of them is the electrocution, the person is dead, but the electrification is not dead, but can have a lot of damages, like uh, injuries. Um, so it's why we talk about both terms. But normally the worker wants to protect himself. Again, the shock hazard will wear uh, rubber or plastic protection. So it's like your safety boots, um, the sole is is in uh, rubber, uh, your safety gloves, it will be insulated gloves in rubber too. Uh, safety a uh, hard hat is the uh, plastic. And uh, if it's class E uh, by CSA Z 94.1 is class E 22 KV um, uh, protection. So this is all plastic or rubber protection. So normally in the standard, you're supposed to protect your worker or yourself uh, if you're exposed over 30 volts. In the American standard, they keep it at 50 volts in 2018. So the protective equipment is just an example. I don't put the hard hat and the uh, boots in it, but the uh, insulated gloves, you have different choice of it. So you will ch choose it about the voltage the worker can be exposed. So the first one is 500 volts. One after that, you have the one kV, 1000 volts. And the last one is 17,000 volts. But you have the class one and the class three and four. So they can go through 36 kV. So it's quite um, high, uh, but uh, if you go higher, it's the, um, the gloves will be thicker and will be longer. So it's why if you want to do some troubleshooting, it's better on with the one kV gloves. But normally you have more troubleshooting on 600 volts than the others. And just remember the your worker is supposed to inspect his own gloves every day he use it. And if you need more information on that, you have just to write to Emily and she will send me uh, your question and I will answer it. I have all the procedure for that point. And um, every six months you have to test it outside. For example, the one kV gloves is supposed to be inspect test at one five kV every uh, six months. The other risk is the electrical arc. So the first, um, so the worker distance from the arc source is really important on that case. 
for example, a normal uh, medium uh, human is uh, around five feet and eight inches. So the distance between his, his, between his fingers and his chest is around 45 centimeter or 18 inches. So all the arc flash calculation on the low voltage equipment is around that, around 45 centimeter, we calculate it. So if the worker is exposed that more than 1.2 calorie per square centimeter at 45 centimeters or 18 inches, he is, he is supposed to wear the arc flash PPE. So uh, this is the second degree burns limit on that point. And remember the temperature can reach really high with the uh, 3000 to 19,000 degrees Celsius. And the sounds level is uh, really big noise is around 141.5 decibels. So it's why when you have to wear this type of category, you're supposed to have uh, ears protection and uh, all ears protection can be good um, for that point. So we don't have a hard flash ear protection. So it can be just normal ear protection on that point. Um, so you need to protect yourself against that risk. Explosion, arc blast is the uh, the last point on that um, of the electrical incident. So if you check uh, the molten copper gives off mostly fumes and bit of gas. So it's why the safety uh, face shield is really important. Uh, so if you wear it, they can protect you against the amount of particles. But uh, Tara will talk to you a lot about that a little bit later. Uh, you can be exposed to shrapnel and heat, respiratory tract burn. So you can just um, smell the uh, inside your lungs this um, the the copper outside and they, they will burn your lungs so it can have a big uh, damage issue on your body and the copper expand a lot of time between solid to gas is 60,000 um, times 7,000 times so it's a, a lot we had a question earlier about um, is there any respiratory protection for arc flash no, no, not right now. They have no respiratory uh, protection for the arc flash. But if you check the category four, you can have a, a blower you can put inside your hood, and uh, you can you will put a, a positive pressure in it. So maybe if an arc flash occur, I have no study on that, but it may be if an arc flash occur, it can be less possibility to have uh, lungs uh, burn on that point. And we'll see the categories uh, later on. Yeah, the category four is a big for the people who know it. It's the big bumper suit, so it's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll talk about it a little bit later. Perfect, thank you. So this is the delimitation of the work area. It's really important to be clear inside your plants, inside your establishment. Just be sure if someone working live inside the electrical equipment, they are supposed to put the safety boundary. Be sure the people or the workers who is not protected be uh, outside this distance or normally the distance is the distance of the 1.2 calorie per square centimeter so it's around one meter to 1.5 meter and maybe more depends on the level of energy the equipment can release uh, so this is a nice example of what you uh, are supposed to see inside your plan so, so now I let uh, Tara for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Pascal. So um, I'll talk a bit about uh, the clothing portion, um, how to protect yourself and maintain uh, your arc rated clothing. So first off, I mean, general question is why do we need arc rated clothing? So we know that uh, on the job, anything working with electricity, the most severe burns and fatalities are caused by non-flame resistant clothing. First off, uh, because they ignite. And secondly, it's because they continue to burn. So with flame resistant clothing or arc rated clothing, what happens is, is that these materials are able to self extinguish. So while there may still be injuries to the wearer, it definitely diminishes those injuries. So, um, just now going back to you'll see uh, AR clothing coming up a lot again that's uh, we're referring to arc rated clothing so all arc rated clothing is considered flame resistant now arc rated clothing takes it one step further and assigns a specific protection level to each garment which is expressed in calories per centimeter squared so what we want um, is self-extinguishing fabrics that could either be achieved through an intrinsically um, 
flame resistant fabric such as Nomex or a fabric that's been treated to be flame resistant. Um, like we see a lot of Tekka Safe or Ultra Soft are to fabrics that we see a lot in the uh, marketplace. So uh, what we're talking about today is what we would call secondary protective clothing meaning that it's meant to be worn continuously in a zone where you do have a risk of hazard. So you get to work in the morning, you put your uh, arc rated clothing on and you wear it while you're in the zone for your designated job. Now, primary protective clothing is meant to be worn in a zone where a hazard has, occur has occurred. So when we're thinking of a firefighter's bunker gear. What flame resistant clothing is not? So important to note that um, R created or FR clothing is de is not designed to provide any false sense of security. We're still not supermen when we're wearing our AR clothing and we're not impervious to injury. So meaning that we still need to instill safe work practices and PPE is always our last line of defense against a hazard. Once we've um, estimated our insert incident energies, then we can figure out what level or category of our created clothing we need. So we know that the majority of any single of single layer garments that we use today in both high and low voltage power lines give us an arc rating of eight calories per centimeter squared or more. So if all your uh, incident energy estimates are less than eight calories, uh, then you're good to go. But what do we do if we have incidents where we need a higher level of protection, higher than eight calories? So this is where the concept of um, either layering garments comes in, or you also have the option to increase the work distance on that equipment. So I'll be focusing um, more on the, the layering option today and how you could add um, perhaps two or more layers of our graded garments in order to meet a higher uh, calorie level or a higher ATPV. This is just um, showing you what happens when an arc flash or an arc blast happens we can see that i mean surprisingly the garments are still intact and they've done not surprisingly but they've done what they're supposed to do we see that the gloves haven't melted so that's an example of showing you how your PPE can protect you so to now we're talking back about uh layering to meet the standards so there's a couple of rules uh for layering of course um, the outermost layer always has to be arc rated, made of FR fabric. Base layers cannot be made of any fabric that's fusible or anything that would melt. So think um, polyester, nylon, spandex. We want to really stick to natural fabri fabrics. I mean, of course, an arc rated base layer would be best, but natural fabrics could work also anything like cotton, silk, or wool. And to note is that two light layers could sometimes provide a better protection level than a single heavier layer and may be more comfortable. So one of the major dangers uh, in an arc incident is a threat of break open, so meaning your PPE literally breaks open or rips open, exposing your, your flesh to the incident. So a base layer can help protect the body from those second degree burns. And uh, I mean, layering is part of the overall goal of your art flash program, which is to minimize in, in, injury to your workers. So here we have an appendix to um, the ASTM 1506 standard, which uh, generally deals with standard performance specification for an arc flash material worn by electricians. So in this appendix, basically what it's doing is providing guidelines for the proper layering of arc rated clothing. So it's important to note, and, and the most important takeaway from this appendix is that um, multi-layer systems have to be tested together in order to get your total calorie protection. So you can't simply say that shirt A has uh, is 8 calories and shirt B is 10 calories, so together they're 18 calories. It doesn't work like that. The system as a whole needs to be tested to understand what level of protection you're getting. 
And there's a great tool to help um, understand this on the Bulwark FR website. So we've created kind of an arc rating or calorie calculator. So these are sets of garments that Bulwark has tested together and has provided you with the total arc rating for the system. So let's say you're looking to reach an arc rating of 24 calories. What you can do is you go on the Bulwark site um, and put in, let's say, the product number of your shirt. And what the calculator will do will give you all possible options and combinations to layer to meet your 20, 24 calories. So it's a great, great tool. Uh, it's open to anyone. So on bulwark.com slash calculator. So we talked a lot about selecting the correct garment. And um, it's important to note that of course, we need to select the correct garment with the correct protection level. However, another important part of setting up a safety program is training your employees on how to wear their PPE, how to maintain their PPE. So in the next slide, we can see um, AR do's. And if we go one further, we see AR don'ts. So the main point to remember here is, I mean, you have a shirt. A shirt should always be tucked in and buttoned up. First off, um, providing neck protection and also reducing airflow, which can increase the intensity of an arc explosion. So again, reiterating, it's important sometimes to police uh, the way your workers are actually wearing their PPE. Tara, we have a question yeah. here. What's your opinion on how best to layer your total protective system? Equal weight items, heavy over light or light over heavy? Um, I would go heavy over light. Uh, definitely. I mean, it's, it's really a preference and how comfortable you are. You can wear two button down shirts, one on top of the other. Of course, I mean, as a general preference, you would assume you would want to take the two possible lightest garments to make you know, your total arc rating. So you can take your standard seven ounce shirt and then you could find a 5.5 ounce base layer and still reach a pretty high level of protection without having to wear two heavy pieces. So I, as a personal preference and assuming, you know, a lot of you are working in very hot conditions, I would stick with the light, the two lightest options to reach your goal. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, so back to now, you know, making sure that the PP is being worn properly. Maintenance is another important part. And uh, standards primarily focus on the care and maintenance instructions provided by the garment manufacturer. So any uh, manufacturer of arc rated clothing should provide uh, instructions on how to properly care and wash your PPE to make it as durable as possible and to ensure that it keeps its uh, arc rated properties for the life of the garment. So just in the next slide, you'll just see an example of a bulwark tag. So this is a pretty standard tag on any uh, flame resistant garment. Uh, we know that we shouldn't be using bleach. We shouldn't be using fabric softeners, but there is further instructions. Um, if you go on bulwark.com or any other manufacturer will likely be able to provide the same. Um, sometimes there's reference to using hard water, not using hard water. There's a there's a level of temperature that certain garments could be washed at. Uh, too high temperature could mess with your, um, your FR properties. So very important to properly care for the garments and, and uh, get the correct maintenance instructions. Um, in, so another important part is when laundering, um, that's fine and well to, to take your clothes home and wash them or send them out to be washed. But we, what really needs to be monitored is the accumulation of grease and oils and chemicals, which could actually act as accelerants and, and harm you while wearing your PPE. So you want to make sure that if you smell an odor after it's been washed, a gas odor, hydrocarbon odor, this garment needs to be rewashed. Uh, you really want to remove anything that can accelerate an arc flash or arc flash. Uh, a simple spaghetti stain on your shirt is not going to mess with its FR properties, but really pay attention to anything that has an odor or that looks greasy. 
So, um, again, there is uh, the option to have garments repaired. Um, PPE is expensive, so because you know you have a little hole doesn't mean that you need to throw it away. But it's important to note that um, if a garment is repaired, it must be made with the same fabric and findings that match the protection level of the original garment. And um, some other points to look for uh, while inspecting your workers' PPE is, is the fit correct? Um, certain cotton blends may shrink. So you want to make sure that the garment is not too tight or too loose. And again, going back to looking at stains, particularly the ones that are oily, sticky, or have a, a strange smell or a gassy smell, and the garment's integrity in general. So look at tears, rips, loose seams, holes, um, just generally making sure that the integrity of the garment is still intact uh, during the workday. So yes, we're just kind of reiterating here again, we're looking for holes, tears, or checks for areas of heavy wear. So elbows and knees are a big one. Uh, bending down often or bending your arms where fabric could be worn thin. So good to check those. And uh, also your seams anywhere that you have a sewing, make sure they're not ripped. And basically treat it as you would your, your fall harness. So in summary, just a few uh, pointers that, that I would look for in selecting an, an FR garment or an arc rated garment. You want to ask for the manufacturer's guarantee in writing on their letterhead and signed if possible. Um, you want to also ask to see the certification by garments. So because perhaps one garment was certified doesn't mean that they all were. Uh, many garments are certified by third parties uh, like Underwriters Laboratory and any manufacturer will be able to provide you with um, any collateral you need. And with that, that would be um, the end of um, my portion on closing and I could take it back to Pascal unless we have questions. No, you, okay. Pascal, you can, uh, yeah. Thank you, Tara. So uh, for the, the rest of the presentation, we talk about the category. So uh, we have four categories of clothing. Uh, since 2015, in, in the standard version, they, uh, they released the category zero. Uh, now you have category one, two, three, uh, and four. So category one, you're supposed to be protected at least at four calories per square centimeter, category two at eight. So category one and two is quite pretty similar, but the big difference between both of them is the level of energy and the balaclava you wear under the face shield. So if you want just wear category one, you don't have to wear the balaclava under the face shield. And uh, like Tara said, you have a lot of type of uh, clothing right now so it's not just coverall or shirt and pants uh, you have a lot of different type of clothes um, for your hands you're supposed to protect your hands with a leather part if you are exposed to a shock hazard you will put a rubber part underneath the, um, the leather part and your safety boots or shoes are supposed to be in leather uh, top on in leather too so uh, this is the category two um, uh, protection equipment and the uh, category uh, three and four is quite similar to category three you're supposed to be uh, protected at least at four at 25 carry per square centimeter and category four at 40 but I practically no plan to use the category one or three. They always use category two and four. And uh, earlier in the presentation, we have a question about the uh, level of energy about the cal calorie per square centimeter because um, now in the standard, they want to have two separate things. You have the category, like I just explained you, and you have the calorie per square centimeter. Um, you can use two. So for for example, with the, now you can go with the one layer suit to 12 calorie per square centimeter. So you can buy a 12 calorie per square centimeter and you are able to go through that. And uh, if you are over 12, now it depends on the risk assessment of the equipment. So you can go over 4D, but it depends on the electrical installation, the maintenance of the equipment. So yeah, 
have a lot of those things. So like I said, 2018 of the American Standard is a lot with the risk assessment. If you check the front page of the American Standard, it's really like the the, the same uh, rules than the machine safety now. So it's uh, so uh, working out voltage first and other things like that. So the risk assessment, you have two approach. Like I said, you have the test method. Now you have, um, since 2015, we have three tables. They changed the number of the table in 2018. Now the table three, if you say, if I remember, is, uh, is the task. Um, if you need your PP or not, depends on the level of risk, as uh, of the risk assessment. So this is the first table. And the two other tables now is 6A and 6B is about the 6A is about the, uh, the type of equipment with the short current circuit. It can be released uh, and the time, the delay of reaction of the system. So uh, the sys A, for example, for the equipment um, under 240 volts, it's, it's just an example like that. It's category one. Uh, for an equipment between 240 to 600 volts, depends on the level, of short, the level of short current circuit. It can be category two or four, depends on the equipment. So this is the method of task. And the other method is about the incident energy uh, uh, method so it's the uh, labeling so like I said I try to keep it simple so this is the engineering study and a lot of people ask is the safety uh, issue but it's not just a safety issue it's a maintenance issue 90 percent of that job is maintenance so we update your uh, one line diagram uh, we check your coordination study just be sure your breaker uh, release at the proper time uh, we check the short current circuit. This is up to date and this is good for your fuses or your breakers. And after that, we put the labels on. And why I put the category with the calorie per square centimeter? Uh, it's about the question um, I had a little bit later, um, earlier. It's uh, because it's for the comprehension between the contractor and the workers. Because I have a lot of paper mills, for example, all the electrician. Um, in the paper mills know what is the carry per square centimeter so they know his suit is eight and they are not supposed to go over eight but for the contractors a lot of, uh, of uh, contractors is on the category so they know they know what is the category two suit but they don't know what is the eight carry per square centimeter so it's why when we mark all book together it's better for both sides when a contractor go on in a plan they don't know they have the information and is why i write it on the same uh, line so if you check the line it's really simple to understand category two in parenthesis you have eight carry per square centimeter at 45 centimeter so this is the reason because it's category two so it's helped to improve the comprehension and when i tested on the workers they really like it so this is uh, i think an improvement on the standard on that case and this is an example of the first the, the table of task on the risk assessment of the task. So we had the table three, like I said, uh, for a safe maneuver, the following six points must be observed after machine shutdown. So normally you're supposed to stop your machine, just be sure you have no charge, no current charge on your machine to do an arc flash. After that, you inspect your equipment. If the equipment is properly installed, if the equipment is properly maintained, if the equipment must be used following the manufacturer uh, guidelines, if the equipment has been properly closed with bolts, well screwed all covers are in place and no evidence of defects or damage now they can move the disconnect devices uh, with no ppe if it's under it is low voltage low voltage in canada is 750 volts and below so um, it's really important to understand the, that that point so this is um, a, a figure i, I did uh, to explain that, that point and the last point is about the emergency measures when in contact with electricity. Uh, we can help you on that point to help you to build your own emergency procedures on that. So for example, if um, a worker um, when in contact with electricity, the first thing the electrician is supposed to know is uh, to um, put the, the power off uh, as soon as he can. After that, it will try to uh, call 911 
After that, he will put his insulated gloves with the insulated stick. If you have it, so you don't have insulated stick, you can use insulated gloves. And uh, when they release the guy from the contact, they, um, they start the, um, the CPR or the uh, first aid uh, procedure. So um, this is an example uh, fast of the emergency measure on that point. So the reference sense of the today webinar is the CSA Z462 2018 version and the NFP 7018. So like I said, is really on risk assessment right now. So uh, I'm in engineering. I did a lot of arc flash study and sometimes we have to take a decision and this is what the standard asks it depends on the level you calculate depends on the um, the condition of the equipment now we have to take a decision just be sure the the, the worker will be safe so the, this is um, a nice uh, new area for the standard all right, thank you, Pascal. Um, as mentioned before, at the beginning of the webinar, we are looking to see now uh, at what stage do you find yourself in the implementation of your electrical safety program. So we want to know from what you've learned and what you've heard. Um, are you still? Do you still have the same thinking as? Uh, 45 minutes ago so if you could please take a few seconds to answer if uh, a b c d or e uh, is more appropriate to your situation and we would like to compare the results from the beginning with the, the results right now all right okay so um 20 percent of um Okay, 20% of uh, the people have mentioned that they, they don't have a program or planning to build one, so it went down a little bit. 20% uh, still need to be trained and updated on the training requirements, and 60% are in full control of their preventive program. So what I'm understanding is, is that you have answered a few questions that people uh, needed some clearance on some, some uh, specifications, maybe what... Yeah, that's awesome to hear. So, I mean, 60%, uh, that's a huge number. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, there's always more to learn. The standards are always changing. Uh, even experts in the field are learning uh, every day as the standards evolve. But, I mean, that's a great number. So, I'm glad that um, the resources we provided were helpful. And uh, That means people are more secure. That's <laughs> we it. We like those exactly. high, high numbers. And it's why it's really important to adapt your um, safety, um, electrical safety rules inside your plan. Just be sure you're really in control of your, your risk. And if you need any help, just ask Emily about that. And uh, it will be a pleasure to answer you on that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always better to ensure you're fully in control than just assume because obviously safety first, right? right. Excellent. Thank you very much for, um, for uh, answering this uh, interactive question. Um, um, I don't know if there was any questions we didn't answer um, uh, as we went along. However, if you do have questions, uh, once again, you can send them to my uh, email. Um, uh, the, we, yeah, you can send it to my email or to marketing at spi-s.com. Uh, you can even call me. I will transfer your questions to Tara or Pascal, depending on the nature of your question. Uh, if you also need... Um, uh, any any um, auditing or any uh, training, uh, same thing. Just reach out. Will be our pleasure to uh, support you with this. Um, before we go, well, first of all, thanks, Tara. Uh, thanks, uh, Pascal, for the presentation and all of the details you've explained. Uh, and thanks for being generous in your time. Also for the questions that people may have after the webinar. Um, before we go, we ask you to fill out a quick survey. It's a few seconds, 30 seconds uh, or less, uh, a few questions that help us to evaluate how we did and how we could do better, but also to uh, help us uh, figure out your needs in terms of what other types of uh, webinar or events we could do uh, and address another topic that may be of interest to you. So please take the time. Uh, we really appreciate it. Otherwise, we hope to have you on board with our future OHS webinar. Um, stay tuned. One is coming up at the end of October, and in November, there's a few as well. Uh, so register on our Facebook page or on our LinkedIn page or directly on our website to our newsletter. And for the rest, we wish you a great day and be safe. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Bye-bye.